Good evening for everybody in Brazil. Good morning for everybody in Korea. Good afternoon for everybody in the United States. Thank you so much for joining our eight um, Brazil-Korea uh, Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. My name is Sujong Ko. I'm the founder of this initiative that I started in 2016. I started this initiative with a, uh, the support of a few institutions and friends. It was supposed to just help a few entrepreneurs, but it's actually grow over time. And today we are celebrating the eighth edition. So thank you so much for everybody to come here to celebrate this eighth edition. We have uh, uh, the support, support and sponsorship from uh, various institutions. So thank you again for uh, helping us and make this initiative possible. Because we have the speakers from Korea, uh, differently from the that we usually do in Portuguese, we uh, we are speaking in English so that everybody can uh, understand, be on the same page, and we don't rely on the translation. So here in Brazil, it's uh, 8, 6 p.m. In Korea, it's 8, 6 a.m. In We have people uh, speakers from the United States, uh, probably from someone uh, for, for those who are in San Francisco, it's about it's 4, 6 uh, p.m. So it's a uh, very challenging for us to do this seminar in different time zones. Thank you again for everybody's support. So before I introduce the speakers, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about what this initiative means. So it's in Portuguese, it's called Ciclo de Palestras Brasil Coreia. So I started this initiative in 2016. Everybody must remember we are in the middle of a uh, political and economic crisis. So I started this to help with a few entrepreneurs or young people who are having difficulty uh, to, get, to in, enter the uh, job market and it grow. So I, I'm very, very excited to keep doing this every year. We started doing it uh, uh, once a year, but uh, two, three years ago, we started doing this uh, twice a year. So today is the eighth edition that we are doing this. So I would like to uh, ask uh, um, uh, Joel from the embassy to give a, a welcoming to everybody to this event. Then we have uh, uh, um, Mauricio from the IBRE and Marta uh, from Behevisa, uh, one of the uh, sponsors of our initiative. Then I will um, talk about our program today. Our uh, target is actually to finish this, uh, this event uh, within two hours and 30 minutes because it's quite, uh, uh, quite exhausting to stay for more than three hours which is very different from when we did uh, uh, an offline event. So let's uh, let's do uh, in, in a fastest uh, track. So Joao, I would like to ask you to give a welcoming to everybody so that we can uh, we can start our eighth seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sejong. <clears throat> Thank you, Mauricio, Marta. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm very grateful for the invitation. I believe that uh, Korea uh, has a lot of opportunities for Brazilian entrepreneurs. Um, and the, the Embassy of Brazil in Seoul is open to, to, to receive you, to receive your questions. Please reach us. Today, Thiago Matos will make a presentation is, about our bilateral sites. trade. Uh, and but uh, I will not be able to 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 be here during all the the, the events. But you are you are more than, than welcome at the embassy uh, uh, with your questions at the moment you, you want. So have a nice event. Nice to to, to see you all. Nice to to hear. Thank you, Joel. So now I ask Mauricio to also give a warm uh, welcoming to everybody.
Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, I'm the president of IBRE, which is the Brazilian Institute for uh, Development of International Business Relations. And it's a pleasure to be here once more supporting this wonderful initiative of Sue. Uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to, to know Sue for several years now. She's one of the founders of the Institute and we've been together uh, developing uh, this and uh, supporting the, the entrepreneurs from Brazil to reach the foreign markets and the, so the and, uh, entrepreneurs from the foreign markets to uh, get in touch here with the companies in Brazil also. And so uh, it's an honor to be here together with you all. And I hope uh, you have a wonderful event and also the Institute is open to everybody, so if you need any kind of uh, information and support regarding Brazil, or if you are a Brazilian company uh, seeking information or uh, seeking some support to uh, reach the foreign market, we're also here to help you. Uh, that's it, Sue, so back to you. Thank you, Mauricio. So now I ask uh, Marta to also give a welcome, uh, welcoming to everybody. Good morning, Korea. Good afternoon, USA. Good night, Brazil. I'm Marta Mikiko, founding partner of BR Visa. It's a great pleasure to participate in the opening of this seminar. And at the time when technological innovation is a factor of economic survival for companies and why not say nations, it is essential that Brazil aligns itself with its not most precious Asian partners, such as Korea which are at the foreign front of innovation. Participating and honor these specialized forums to bring together business people from Brazil and Korea is to fully see the enormous potential of this partner. I congratulate and thank my colleague and friend Sue, the initiative for having involved us and I wish everyone an excellent event. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. So now this is my turn. So as I said, we I started this initiative in 2016 to help uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and we are celebrating eighth edition today. Uh, our uh, seminar is divided in four parts today. So the first part is um, doing business in Korea and Brazil. The second panel is innovation. The third panel is art and culture. And the last panel is infrastructure. So my uh, expectation is that we develop this initiative with your support so that we can have other panels. There are many other panels that we could develop. So I'm asking also for your support throughout the year, okay? So each panel uh, will have a moderator because <laughs> I've done uh, presentation of all these speakers and it was quite uh, exhausting. So this time I asked uh, some uh, supporters to uh, share the tasks with me. So I asked a few uh, investors to take this role to be moderator. So thank you so much for your help, right? So the first panel doing business in Korea and Brazil, we will have um, uh, Dario Habai who is ambassador of a series of lecture Brazil Korea 2021 and partner of Sescom Barrio Advogados. So he will uh, lead the panel one. So we can start now. And in sequence, I will keep introducing the, uh, the respective um, moderators. So um, for those who um, uh, entered now, just to, to let you know that we are recording this seminar we are going to share this seminar um, on social media and also send to the uh, to, to uh, email to everybody. So uh, please turn off the microphone and the video if you do not want to be on the video, okay? So Dario, can you start your panel and have have a great uh, time, everybody? Uh, I'm here to learn also from every single speaker. So thank you again for the supporters and mm -hmm. organizers and and sp <coughs> uh, uh, sponsors. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. 
Uh, my name is Dario Habay, as Suja already said. I'm one of the ambassadors of the series of lectures Brazil Korea 2021 and also a partner of Cisco Bahia. I'll be moderating this first panel uh, about doing business in Korea and Brazil. And I will briefly introduce you to our speakers in the order they, they will be speaking. So we will have Mr. Thiago Matos Moreira, who Hello. is the tech, technical advisor in the trade promotion of the Brazilian Brassi Embassy in Seoul, Korea. Uh, then we will have uh, Mr. Uh, Hyunsik uh, Sun, who is the CEO of the Korea Foreign Assist Center. I'm sorry if I, I misspelled your, your name. Um, and then we have Mr. Giacomo Paro, who is an, also an ambassador of series of lectures Brazil Korea and partner of Soto Korea, Korea Law Firm. And finally, in this panel, we'll have Mr. Bernardo Mira, who is partner of Grow and director of BR Visa. Um, I will start with the, uh, Mr. Moreira. Mr. Moreira, could you please give us a, a, a general overview of the Brazil-South Korea trade relations and, and the work carried out by the Brazilian Embassy in South Korea? Hello, Dario. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here speaking with you all. Can you see my slide? Can, you, can everyone see my slide? Yeah, yeah, wow. it's perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you everyone for having me here today in this event, uh, presenting the Embassy. I'm excited to be here. Uh, as Dario mentioned, my name is Thiago Matos, and I have been working as a trade advisor for the Embassy for the last three years now. And today I'm going to present you a quick overview of the Brazil-South Korea trade relations at this moment, and some of the work we've been developing at the Embassy in supporting Brazilian entrepreneurs into getting to and navigating the Korean market. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to point out this beautiful building on the picture. That is actually our embassy. We are right next to the Kimbokum Palace for the one the ones of you that have been to Seoul. We are the closest embassy to the Blue House um, in Korea, the presidential office, so it's a premium location by all means. But more important than that, we are equipped with uh, those big event halls, we call them Brazil Hall, that not long ago before the pandemic were the venue for various events for promoting Brazilian products, uh, for promoting investment, business rounds, seminars. We want very much so to uh, go back to that as soon as possible, but while it doesn't happen, we are very grateful for having initiatives like this one that we can keep the conversation going between the Brazilian entrepreneurs, the, the Korean businessmen, um, and everyone else. So thank you, Sue. Thank you, the, the, the event, for this opportunity. Uh, before me getting into the more uh, up-to-date content, I'd just like to give some brief historical introduction. As some of you might know, uh, Brazil and Korea are actually very traditional partners. Brazil and Korea established uh, diplomatic relations shortly after the Korean War. Um, Brazil was actually the first country to receive a uh, South Korean embassy in Latin America, and we shortly after opened our embassy here in Seoul as well. And above all the characteristics that, that define this relationship, maybe trade and investment is the most notorious one. Uh, in the recent years, the growth of uh, inv Korean investment in Brazil and the bilateral trade has been enormous. Uh, just in 2018, we reached the amount of $6 billion in Korean investment in Brazil, which not by coincidence led to uh, the largest bilateral uh, trade amount uh, or record so far that elevated Korea to our second biggest trading partner in Asia, which it's no uh, easy feat considering that the first one is China, which is our current uh, biggest trade partner, and it, uh, it and beat up Japan, which has been a, a, a extremely traditional uh, trade partner to Brazil, so which was uh, quite something. So we know that this is a dimension that should be not ignored by both Brazilian and Korean businessmen when they're talking about uh, this relationship. And here is a little bit more up to date, uh, just some raw data to have better picture the, the current state of Brazil and Korea trade relationship. As some of you might already know, um, uh, the, the deficit that Brazil nurtures with this relationship is quite steep. 
and that could be understood basically by the large amount of electronic industrial products that Brazil imports for Korea. So by some metrics, even some could argue that uh, Brazil sustains with Korea our biggest deficit by some by some ways of understanding it. Uh, but of course, that bridge has been gapped a little bit over the years that you can see in this 2019-2020 snapshot, mostly because more and more uh, Brazilian commodities are uh, uh, important part of the the Korean economic and but also a little bit due to the, the valuation of real that made uh, so Korean products a little bit too expensive for the Brazilian consumer but uh, but still by no means the relation is less relevant it's still one of our Brazil's biggest partners both in terms of investment and in terms of of trade but what exactly constitute this trade what we what is our, our daily life here at the embassy here i have a very clear snapshot of all the products that korea import from brazil so we can uh, have a better understanding of it of course you can uh, you can uh, easily pick the usual suspects let's say the ones that are present in nearly every single relationship that brazil nurtures in terms of trade you see corn you see soybean you see iron ore but there are some elements that are special and quite of interest in the Korean uh, in the Korean context. Uh, poultry meat and roasted coffee, for example, well, Brazil has been a leader in the market for over a decade, thanks to the effort of uh, both Brazilian and Korean businessmen, like interested in, in developing uh, in this food and beverage sector, uh, where it's probably one of the areas that we do most activities and like have, have a big engagement. But when it comes down to more recent developments, uh, I like to point out uh, the the could the oil, the could petroleum oils uh, um, section of this image, because it's something very new. Uh, Korea didn't traditionally import a lot of oil from Brazil, but uh, as a recent event, uh, recent policy of trying to diversify their their supplier matrix, uh, it emerged as now our biggest uh, products of export to Korea. Uh, it is a very recent event, like it's something that we're not really used to to see. And also, it coincided with a good moment of, for the oil extraction, especially on the Rio de Janeiro state. So it's something that we might be seeing in the future. And I also like just quickly like to point out the raw cotton uh, segment here, which is also that's something new. Korea didn't like uh, traditionally import cotton from Brazil, but thanks to the effort of Brazilian businessmen, from Abrapa, the Brazilian Cotton Association that recently opened up an office in Asia. We're seeing it as something up and coming a sector of this trade relationship. But of course, on the flip side, as you might expect, uh, when it comes to the pro Korean products exported from Korea to Brazil, it's mostly industrial products. And all of them are more or less related to the presence of big Korean chebols in Korea, Samsung, Hyundai, their uh, industrial complexes in the Amazon state and Sao Paulo state, they are big responsible for moving for uh, creating this movement of the, this inflow of trade from Korea to to Brazil. And you can easily see that like automobiles, uh, semiconductors, um, chemical products, they are in a way uh, related to to this big uh, uh, big groups activities in the country. But of course, even though I, I just named you a bunch of common places, the activities that we do in Brazil are far from not being diverse. In fact, it's uh, we have a very diverse uh, set of partners, of people that we supported in the past and you're supporting now and we want to support in the future. We deal from, from helping uh, companies that deal with propolis, uh, flip-flops, cookies, airplanes, um furniture we we are really open to to have a conversation trying to support basically any brazilian entrepreneur that think there's a they have a good opportunity in korea and we do think there are many opportunities to to be made here because it's to some extent korea is still a untapped market for brazilian businesses man there it's still not very uh on the map of many uh companies that want to to expand their businesses there are many opportunities, but of but of course, where there is there is opportunities, there are also many challenges. Uh, I hear I just I just name a few here. We might discuss that later if you have time. Uh, of course, tariff and regulatory barriers are something that uh, every single exporter, every so everyone that does business abroad, has to deal with, and we are more than happy to try to uh, 
make this as less painful as possible. But one challenge that many Brazilian businessmen find here that it might surprise them is the lack of uh, a vibrant business community here. There are not many Brazilians who reside in Korea. We are less than 1,000. And in the same fashion, there are not many Brazilian companies that have subsidiaries here. There's a few, but it's not as vibrant as, say, other East Asian uh, markets for uh, Singapore, as, as, uh, as Japan, as China. So that is still a barrier for many of them to feel comfortable in trying to enter the, the Korean market. And precisely because of that, we, the embassy, we want to be your first supporters, maybe your, 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 your big, biggest supporters in entering this, uh, this new challenge of, of exploring the Korean market. And that's the reason why we are constantly trying to find ways to engage Brazilian businessmen to know the Korean market, to find partners be it by giving support on international trade fairs, by uh, creating promotional events to raise awareness of the Brazilian product in the Korean market, by uh, doing online and offline business meetings. So we are more than happy to uh, listen to your ideas, to, to listen to your questions and try to help you to, to bring, uh, bring the, the Brazilian entrepreneur energy to, to this market. And for now, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm in. I'm happy to listen to any questions that you might have. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Thiago. Uh, it was very uh, excellent presentation, and and I believe it connects with the Mr. Sun presentation. Uh, uh, Mr. Sun, could you please tell us about the, the the practical guide to doing business in Korea? I think it's a uh, would be very interesting to understand. Uh, about your 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 okay. presentation. I will yeah. try to share his presentation. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Can you see? Yes. Okay, go okay. ahead. Okay, I'll start then. Okay. Well, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Han Sik Song, and I'm the CEO of Korea Foreigner Assist Center, KFAC. Oh, who's this handsome boy? Well, here I am. Okay, today I'd like to tell you a practical guide to doing business in Korea. Next page, please. Okay, if you're interested in doing a business in Korea, you might Google it as I prepare for this presentation. There are so many misconceptions and I'd like to share some of them. It's like true or false question. Well, to do business in Korea, we should eat kimchi. All Korean CEOs are young and very handsome. Just like me, just kidding. South Korea is not safe because North Korean can attack. All Koreans can speak English. Next, please. Uh, to do business in Korea, we should eat kimchi. Mm, no way. We Koreans are not kimchi fighter or kimchi monster. Some of my friends also don't like to eat kimchi, but most of Koreans like kimchi. So if you can eat kimchi well, it'll be easier for you to get familiar with Korean colleagues or business partners. Next page. Next page. Oh, yeah, all Korean CEOs are young and very handsome. No way. Uh, if you like, if you think like this, it means that you watch too many K dramas. But real is real, and the sub drama is sub drama. So we should dream on. And the next page, please. South Korea is not safe because North Korea can attack. Well, it might be true, but there can be worse anywhere. If you come to Korea for your business, or if you travel to Korea only for two days, I think I'm sure you will forget where North Korea even is. Don't worry and be happy in Korea and welcome you in advance. Next page, please. 
All Koreans can speak English? No way. There are lots of men or women who are in phobia with English. Okay, down next page. Okay, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, now let's talk about our main survey. I actually don't know if you already have got an experience in doing a business in Korea or not. So first of all, I'd like to tell you some of updated news regarding Korean business for the person who might already have an experience in Korea. It's a key recent development affecting doing business in our jurisdiction. It's a quite long story, so you do better take photos and let's go for the next page then. I think we have only seven to eight minutes. Am I correct? Okay, next yeah. page, please. So now it's time for the beginner who has got an idea to start a business in Korea. So we can say it's a basic Korean business adequate. Those are very important tips. Uh, respect age and status. Korean business adequate is based on Confucianism and military hierarchy. Having respect for status and age is crucial in Korea culture. Bow and shake hands when appropriate. Koreans bow to their seniors as a sign of respect and greeting. The junior person will always initiate the bow. The bow is usually deep and the senior person will slightly bow to acknowledge the greetings and respect shown. Shaking hands when meeting someone for the first time has become common in Korea these days. However, it hasn't completely overtaken bowing, which is certain circumstances may happen during or before the handshake. To show great respect during handshake, a person with a lower status can shake using both hands, or they can place their hand across their belly or spot uh, it at the forearm like this. So the next one, have you have your business call ready? Yes. Uh, have your business calls ready for exchange during initial meetings? Koreans love to understand status. A business call allows them to have a chance to assess the title, rank, and position of their potential business partner. Before sitting down for your meeting, politely give your business card with both hands and take one in written. Don't put the cards in your pocket. Instead, quickly review the titles, positions, and names on the cards. When you sit down, remember to place the business card on the table and pick it up when the meeting ends. Please remember age and job title relative to, related to others determines how you communicate and behave. A higher age job title will give you more credibility. Give approaches, gift, a, give appropriate gift. Gifts are always welcome in Korea because they symbolize the importance of a relationship. However, Keep in mind that South Korea holds uh, anti graft laws since 2016. This means that your gift to public officers can't exceed a certain amount. Use family or given names properly. During initial meetings, it's best that you use Korean family name when speaking to your business partner bilaterally or when speaking about them when talking another Korean is also useful. However, when you get to good terms with your counterparts, you can use their given name. Enjoy social gathering with business partners. Relationships are crucial when conducting business in Korea, so you can develop these relationships during informal social gatherings. Oftentimes, such informal social gatherings would involve alcohol. Dress in professional business attire. Appearance is vital in Korea. Koreans dress more formally, have very conservative business attire, like, like me today, and don't focus on much individual expression. The last one, public speaking Korean. 
If you truly want to impress your Korean business partner, you should learn Korean. Even a few words can already make a positive impression. Okay, next page, please. Uh, for this presentation, I also asked you, I also asked this to new, my colleagues of my company, and they talked about four things, actually. Uh, Ki-bun, Jung, Chemyeon, Nunchi are very essential tips, but to save our time, let's go for the next page. And if you want to know what these are, please email me. Okay, next page, please. Okay. I can say that Korea is one of the best countries to do a business with these regions from number one to number seven. And these are very regions why I can recommend you to do in business in Korea. Okay, next page, please. And those are the items I'd like to recommend you to start. Please uh, take photos if you want, and it will be very, uh, helpful for you to start your business in Korea. Okay, next page. Next page, please. This is the next page. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you. Uh, I, well, there are my collect employee, there are my contact information. Okay, if there's anything you'd like to know, don't hesitate to ask me. I was Hyunsik Song, a CEO of a Korea Foreign Research Center. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sun, for your uh, nice and, and pleasure uh, explanation. Uh, it was very nice to hear uh, how to do uh, business in Korea and some tips. And, 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 and this cultural is as very important for anyone who wants to do business in Korea. Uh, now I would like to ask Mr. Uh, Giacomo Paro, uh, who is an, also an ambassador of series of lectures, Brazil, Korea, 20, uh, 2021, and a partner of Soto Correa Law Firm. Uh, Mr. Paro, can, can you give us uh, an overview of about the Brazilian tax reform, if you please? Of course. Uh, uh, good morning. Giacomo, Giacomo and uh, Bernardo are the, uh, the next speaker. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Giacomo and Bernardo. Uh, due to the time control, because we have the speakers of other panels and they have to organize themselves. So if you can uh, present within five, six minutes, uh, I would very much appreciate, okay? Thank you so much. For sure. C can you can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I will try to make it full screen. Let's see. C can you see it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sue, uh, for the kind invitation. Thank you, Dario, for the mediation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I decided to took this risk of talking about uh, the Brazilian tax reform. Uh, it's always difficult. Uh, it's uh, normally boring for everyone watching, but I understand that I would try to avoid to be boring, but I, I understand that um, taxation in Brazil is always a key point of concern uh, for anyone that uh, wants to invest in Brazil. So I think that uh, it's important to try to give you uh, to give you a broad explanation about uh, what is uh, being discussed right now um, uh, with uh, with our national Congress regarding the Brazilian tax reform. Um, First, I would like to bring you my view um, uh, regarding the four main uh, problems of our tax system. So anyone that wants to invest in Brazil has uh, or ha have to know that, in, in my opinion, our tax system has four main problems. It is too complex, so taxpayers spend too much time to calculate and collect tax. 
is regressive. So uh, people with less ability to pay normally pays more. Um, we have a lot of special regime tax benefits. So it's always difficult to uh, be sure about um, which rule is applicable, uh, which is the taxation of a certain sector of a certain product, because depending on the region of the country, depending on the services, depending on the sector, you can have special regimes, tax benefits, it's very usual. And uh, finally, uh, we have a um, lot of uh, tax disputes. So given this uncertainty, complexity, normally taxpayers uh, understand that it's better to bring their problems, their doubts to courts, uh, either administrative or judicial court. So we have lots of tax disputes. Uh, it takes too much time to be solved. We have uh, bad decisions given the number of disputes. It's normal to have uh, bad and good decisions. So I believe that these problems should be address it in our tax reform. Uh, let's let's understand if uh, they are being addressed or not. Uh, as we know about two, uh, we are aware of two, uh, at least two uh, proposals of tax reform, two proposals that are going to be discussed. Um, they in very briefly, they intend to, one, reduce the complexity, so it's addressing one of the problems that I mentioned, and two, uh, they want to uh, promote progressivity, which is good because one of the problems is uh, the regressive of our current tax system. So it's, it's uh, uh, going well in that sense. Um, how they, they these proposals intend to do that? First, they, uh, they uh, are proposing to replace uh, some taxes on goods, services, and revenues. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, the, 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 the most important ones here. Uh, they intend to replace these taxes for one tax, which is the IBS, so-called, so known as the VAT, value-added tax. And this proposal intend to eliminate or at least reduce all these tax benefits and special regimes. So we can see that uh, the main problems that I mentioned, they are being addressed by our tax reform. But what, what is going to be the point discussed during this uh, discussion on our National Congress regarding the tax reform? Are we going to have one VAT, or so-called IBS, or are we going to have two VATs? You can see that we are starting to uh, get it more complex uh, because the federal government wants one VAT, a federal VAT, but the states and municipalities want wants two VATs because they want uh, a VAT for themselves. So let's have two VATs. So this is, this is going to be a point of discussion. Uh, second, tax rates. Are we going to have uh, one VAT with one tax rate for all the products, all the services, all the sectors, or are we going to have different tax rates? That's, that's a problem that uh, is going to be discussed. Taxpayers are doing their maths, and they will, um, they will have uh, claims on uh, tax um, raising. So they will doing they will, they are doing their maths and do, they will bring their maths to the Congress. And states and municipalities are doing the same. They are doing their maths in order to understand if they are going to be collecting more, if they are going to lose power to audit tax, and these are going to be problems discussed during um, the, this process of reforming the tax system. And finally, I'd like to bring three key points that are not uh, um, in the proposals, but I believe that our National Congress is going to discuss them. Um, 
First, the income taxation. We have to um, be prepared for increasing on the rates of income taxation, both for entities and individuals. And we have to be prepared for the end of the div dividend exception. As you may know, in Brazil, we do not pay income tax on dividends. So we, we should expect that these benefits will not last, probably. Uh, second point, tax on financial transactions. Our Minister of Economy always uh, say about uh, his desire of having a tax on financial transactions. Um, similar to the CPMF, uh, CPMF that we had in the past. And third, uh, we should expect some discussions on alternative methods for solve tax uh, disputes, like arbitration um, and some sort of mediation. Um, and this is a good thing. Okay, so um, being very quick and quickly and trying to keep uh, on track on my time here, uh, that that these are my points. Thank you, and I'm at your disposal for any doubts. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Giacomo Paro. Uh, it was very clarifying, although it's it's very quick. We don't have a lot of time, but uh, it was very uh, important, and and I I, I see that that. Uh, we really need this tax reform. Uh, now I would like to, to um, give the word to Mr. Bernardo Mira, who is partner and growth director of BR Visa. Uh, Mr. Mira, uh, could you please explain to us uh, the modalities of investors visa? Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk you, uh, uh, with you all. OK, uh, we're going to talk about the modalities of investors visa. Just a minute, are you seeing the presentation? Uh, not yet, we are seeing uh, your your screen, I think. Let me see. Are you looking to now or, or not yet? Just a minute. And now? Try now, again. Yes. Yeah. Now we are seeing your presentation. Go on. Thank you. Uh, first, BR Visa is a company that works with global mobility. We help business, uh, families, and entrepreneurs to move from Brazil to abroad and from other countries to Brazil. We assist in a 360-degree solution to every aspect of relocate someone to Brazil. Uh, do the short period of time. I will speak briefly. OK, one of the most important uh, uh, thing to point out that you do not need an investor's visa to buy an asset or a property in Brazil. OK, to do it, it's enough if you have a CPF, that's a taxpayer card. OK, however, if you want to move to Brazil to to make residence in Brazil, OK, to stay for longer periods of time or even to administrate your own company, you need an investor's visa. OK. Uh, the first one that I will speak, it's uh, the uh, individual investor's visa that a person need to invest uh, the minimum of 500,000 Brazilian reais into a Brazilian company, okay? One important aspect of this visa that the person is only allowed to administrate uh, his own company if uh, after the visa is approved by the Ministry of Justice, uh, and then when the person comes to Brazil and apply for the visa, uh, the person becomes a tax resident in Brazil. That it's also a very important issue. The second time uh, type of investor's visa, okay, talking about individual visa, uh, it's a real estate visa that a person invests in a property in Brazil, the minimum of 1 million Brazilian reais, okay? Uh, if the person decides to invest in a property located in the north of northeast of the country, uh, this investment uh, drops 30%. So with 700,000 Brazilian reais, the person gets the real estate investor visa. And one issue that also is very important regarding this visa, it's that the person have the possibility to become tax resident in Brazil. So it's very important to plan yourself before you buy the real estate, before you buy the property, okay? 
uh, and then you apply for the investor's visa because otherwise you can get the the uh, 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 the situation that you become tax resident and Brazil when you are a tax resident you are tax resident in a worldwide basis okay so it's very important to plan yourself before you apply for this real estate investor's visa and last but not least important we have the director's or administrator visa okay that it's when a, a company from abroad uh, a foreign company uh, invests the minimum of 600,000 brazilian reais per person okay uh, into a brazilian company and with this investment the company is allowed to elect someone to be the directors or the administrator and represent the company's uh, the company was willing in the in brazil okay uh, also the person is only allowed to to exercise this job uh, his job or, or the, the the administrator job or directors after the approval of the visa okay by the minister of justice and when this person comes to the country with the visa uh, the person also becomes tax resident in the country uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all Thank you, Bernardo Mira. Uh, now I, I move back to, to, to Sue to start our uh, second panel, uh, which will be moderated by Caetano Alfatin. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dario, for moderating the panel one. Thank you, all the speakers, for the excellent content. It was great to learn from you. So now let's move on. Uh, we are 10 minutes late, so uh, I apology, apologize for the delay to the speakers coming now. So now we are on uh, panel two, innovation. I, uh, I would like to ask Gaetano Altafin, founder and CEO of Ugo App, startup supported by, by us, to moderate this panel. We have a distinguished speaker, so uh, please Gaetano, uh, you, you can start as a moderator. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here tonight in Brazil and this morning, uh, Friday morning. In South Korea. So first we'll have Mr. He Suk Jung, Head of Investment at SK Gas. He's a corporate venture capitalist focused on clean tech, renewables, and sustainability. We also have Mr. Solomon. Managing and founding partner at Red Point Ventures, uh, and as I know, one of the most experienced professionals in Brazil's innovation ecosystem. We also have Mr. Ji Wong Jang, founder of Tewida, is the number one cleaning app. Lastly, I will have, have Mr. Guilherme, partner at Technique, Quintino, and Salina Advogados, who is about sharing economy and regulatory changes challenges in Brazil. So, Kaito, no, uh, let me just uh, interrupt uh, you for a second a because the connection is not good, so it's a little difficult for everybody to listen, right? So let me let me just take this uh, word. So first we have uh, Mr. He Jong, Head of Investment, SK Gas, USA. Uh, which um, CBC in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, United States. So Mr. Um, Jong will talk about SK case as a CBC in overseas markets. Then I will uh, I, I, I'll keep uh, introducing other speakers. So Mr. Jong, thank you. Hi, um, uh, it's great to be here and also uh, I really do uh, thank you for having me here and uh, giving us the uh, opportunity to uh, introduce our company and what we do here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief introduction of our company and also go into where we uh, focus as an investment thesis and also give you uh, where we uh, focus uh, when we make investments and where we really add values to uh, startups. Uh, if you can see the screen, please do let me know, but I'm, I see it on the screen, yes, so I'm gonna move forward. It's Great. Great. Um, SK is a company from Korea. Uh, not many people know about us because we don't make consumer products like our competitors do. 
uh, like Samsung or LG or Hyundai, but um, uh, it's a uh, either second or third largest uh, conglomerate in Korea, depending on the revenue level every year. But uh, we have uh, four uh, major verticals. One is energy and chemicals. Uh, second is uh, semiconductors and materials. Uh, third, logistics services and bioscience. And lastly, ICT. Uh, it, this ranking changes every year, but it just shows the uh, uh, global presence where we are. Uh, I saw up to 50th and I saw down to 80th, but it changes every year depending on the revenue size. But uh, uh, in 2019, uh, was uh, 73rd. Uh, I think 2020 was a little bit higher because uh, our revenue was about 160 billion. And this year we project over 200 billion. So hopefully uh, we will get up there as we move forward. Uh, we have about 90 different affiliates within SK, uh, meaning we have that much penetration into consumers from different directions. And that's what we try to uh, uh, really utilize when we, uh, uh, you know, open different businesses. Uh, we've been spending a lot more time on social value. Uh, uh, we've got four uh, distinctive pillars for social value. One is uh, double bottom line where we pursue after social and economic values. And we try to uh, share the tangible and intangible shared uh, infrastructures and assets from SK with other uh, society and also try to build and create a social value community and ecosystem with with the uh, uh, consumers itself. And uh, we also think about the uh, uh, global presence to be another important uh, aspect because uh, we are not very known to uh, global players, like I said in the beginning, and we are slowly uh, expanding into different geographies. We are operating in over uh, 30 different countries and uh, we are trying to be more uh, globally uh, present by investing more money into different startups and companies and also uh, try to bring that ecosystem back to Korea. So uh, going deeper into different uh, uh, pillars, uh, number one is energy and chemicals. Uh, we used to have the uh, largest refinery complex in the world. We still produce 1.3 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, we are not proud of that. So we are transitioning from an oil and gas company into an energy company by uh, uh, constructing more renewables and transferring all those uh, uh, fossil fuel oriented uh, fuel source into uh, renewables. And we are building 12 uh, gigafactories around the world for EV batteries. Um, we are making investments into electrification and also for hydrogen economy. And, and that's really the uh, whole focus of having multiple offices here in Silicon Valley, making investments into different areas. Uh, the next part is ICT. Uh, SK Telecom has more than 50% of market share in Korea, and they've been the uh, core part of our body for uh, software. And semiconductor and materials, uh, they've been a very good cash cow for us. Uh, we've acquired SK Hynix back in 2015. Uh, recently, we bought uh, uh, Intel's home NAND system for 10 billion, and uh, we uh, keep continuing to uh, uh, expand that market share so that uh, we can continue to dominate this market with other competitors that we have. And logistics and services and bioscience. Bioscience is definitely a new area that we are starting to put more money into. Uh, don't get us wrong, uh, because we've been uh, making investments into bioscience for the past 20 years. Uh, now we are starting to get some uh, output uh, from these areas. We are working with AstraZeneca and Novavax from uh, US uh, for um, corona vaccines, and we are trying to dominate this vaccine market under uh, cancer vaccines and other orphan drugs that we are trying to develop more. And uh, having said that, we have uh, five offices here in Silicon Valley making uh, investments into uh, each industries. And I think uh, this one slide is something that you can take away from my presentation, uh, meaning uh, this is what we are looking for, basically. Uh, we are looking for CTSP solutions, uh, which are uh, customer centric uh, of, of the whole e equation. The one thing that doesn't change is the customer. We got to solve the pain point and the problems that customers are having by providing the technology. So it's got to be technology driven. And uh, the service is the product or the service that you guys are trying to provide to the customers to solve that problem. So uh, it's got to have a, have the uh, service solution. And lastly, the platform provider is the business model that you guys are uh, supplying that uh, solution with. And of course, uh, it would have to make sense uh, in terms of economic values and of course also helping with the social values. And uh, you got to know your competitors. 
And uh, that really comes down to uh, how you guys are opening your business with a business model that's not has been the uh, uh, ordinary cases in presence. And uh, uh, speaking a little bit more from the energy transition, because uh, that's where I spend about 50% of my time. Uh, the other 50% I spend on uh, construction technology and also uh, property technology. Uh, uh, decarbonization, digitization, and also decentralization has been the core focus. And uh, we are doing this uh, 3Ds for uh, transforming the uh, fossil fuel into electrification of everything and also hydrogen economy. Uh, this is what we have been doing. We opened our office in 2018 here in Silicon Valley just for the uh, energy uh, uh, and construction and property investments. Uh, we've made about 10 investments, now uh, 12 investments. Uh, I was able to exit three companies and uh, I am involved in a, a lot more accelerators than I uh, put up here. Uh, this is a little bit outdated, but I work with uh, uh, several uh, governments from US, uh, also from Canada, UK, France, Germany, Swiss, Portugal. And I try to work with other startups in different uh, ecosystems to really connect them all, because eventually what we can do is help them uh, uh, globalize and uh, provide pilots and also uh, provide project financing for them to try out their solutions in different geographies. And uh, one thing uh, for startups uh, to be careful is uh, you may not want to work with uh, CVCs at the very early stage because eventually, uh, no offense to other CVCs on the uh, attendance, but um, uh, we eventually drive these startups to where they are providing their solution to fit our company, not our competitors. But you may want to have a broader uh, uh, spectrum of your solution to satisfy more customers rather than one or two. So you have to be very careful of working with uh, right CVCs at the right time. And that's what we really try to do as well. Uh, we try to work with the uh, startups who are ready to go to the international market, who's gone through this uh, era. So uh, uh, we usually work with uh, companies in post Series A uh, all the way up to pre-IPO companies. Uh, if we we sometimes make uh, investments into public companies, but the investment size will be uh, over a billion dollar, and our check sizes for uh, uh, startups will be between one million and forty million dollars. And uh, uh, like I said, uh, we like to help them financially and also with project financing for taking them to different countries. So that's about it for myself, and I hope to uh, uh, turn it over to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jung, for the great presentation. So moving on, uh, I would like to invite Anderson Thies, uh, investor of our series lectures, Brazil, Korea, and, uh, and managing partner of Red Point Ventures. So Anderson, can you talk about the ecosystem of venture capital in Latin America and startups in Latin America? Hello, good evening. Thank you, Sue, for the invitation. I'll try my best here to speed up a little bit. I have a few slides here I'll try to share with you. Give me one second. Oh my God. Just a second. Microsoft playing with me here. Let me try again, sorry. There we go. Can you see it? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's processing. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Let's go from the beginning. Uh, so once again, uh, uh, the idea here is to go over a little bit of the development of the ecosystem of entrepreneurship in uh, Latin America. Uh, quickly, I'm a managing partner and founder of uh, Red Pointy Ventures. We are an early stage VC fund. We do uh, seed Series A and Series B investments in uh, Latin America, mostly in Brazil. Uh, personally, my background, I'm an investor since 2003. Before that, I had a career as a software developer. I'm a computer engineer by training, and I have participated in a few uh, uh, 
projects in Brazil, Redpoint since 2012. Before that, I was responsible for the entry of NASPERS in the Americas uh, on the internet side. A uh, few uh, uh, of our uh, investments are now uh, at a much bigger scale than we anticipated when we, we first started. Uh, a little bit about uh, Redpoint Eventures. We are a local fund, but we are partners with a global network of funds. Redpoint and Eventures are two US funds, and we have presence in uh, Europe and Asia, uh, not to mention Silicon Valley, where both uh, Redpoint and Eventures are headquartered. Uh, Here's a quick overview of uh, what happened in Brazil in the ecosystem since we started in 2012. Uh, prior to that, uh, we had a little bit of uh, uh, what we call a uh, nuclear winter in Brazil after the bubble burst. And then uh, advertising didn't really work in Brazil. So it was only around uh, 2010, 2011 that we started to see the first companies in the internet really working in Brazil most of them uh, around uh, e-commerce. Uh, we had a very interesting start uh, for uh, the cycle of the macroeconomy in Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, that was very uh, fast. So from 2016, especially, and Sue mentioned in the beginning, uh, with the, the crisis and the political crisis, especially in Brazil, winds turned a little bit for the macroeconomy. But oddly enough, uh, that was not uh, uh, the case for technology. It was actually the best cycle in our history. So just to give a little bit of perspective, uh, this slide was actually in our pitch deck to raise our first fund in 2012. And uh, the, what we had as an ecosystem there was 65 seed and early stage deals in all of 2012. In 2010, we had only 16. Uh, so after that, you see it's very little activity. What we saw was actually an increased speed in the ecosystem in Brazil really, really fast. And uh, it got, got basically all the, the bases covered. And uh, today we have absolutely everything we need as an ecosystem to work in, uh, in, uh, in our region. And uh, uh, one of the projects that we are involved with and we are super proud of, uh, we actually hosted one of the events there, right? So it's Kubo. It's a, a place we co-founded with Itaú, Redpoint Ventures and Itaú. And it's a, a, a hub, a meeting point for the ecosystem in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, one of the last things we saw evolving in our uh, region was the big exits. This was something we were uh, questioning whether we would see uh, these uh, transactions of this type. And now there isn't a, a question anymore. The other uh, aspect that was one of the last things we saw evolving here was the corporations, the participation of uh, large corporations and them starting to build their CVC uh, activities here. This is now in full swing. It's working really well. Most of the companies either have something already in place or are talking about it. So uh, uh, we are now in a very interesting moment and we feel that it's only the, the beginning. So our feeling as an ecosystem is that we have now all the conditions. We grew roughly 10 times in the last five years. And we are still really, really small compared to what we should be doing. Uh, so compared to what I mentioned before, right? We had the 16 deals in 2010. And now in 2018, we had 30 funds. So if you imagine each of these funds will have uh, 15, 20 uh, deals at least. It's a completely different uh, ball game. The ecosystem is, is much, much better developed today uh, in Latin America. And uh, one of the latest and biggest announcements was the commitment of SoftBank with a $5 billion fund for the region. Uh, quickly again, in terms of funding, in 2010, we had a little bit of seed investments, 
not much in early, not, not much in growth. And over time, we got uh, uh, a, a lot or a lot more of early stage investing. Uh, then we had an explosion in uh, seed. It, it was a lot of activity. These deals are now maturing too early, and now we have a very robust growth as well. So the ecosystem is complete. Uh, nevertheless, it's much smaller than what it should be, given the size of the economy in Brazil. Uh, we have a very strong uh, macroeconomic and uh, demographic support for the market and a much bigger market than we have today. Uh, and last but not least, uh, most of the big companies in the world today are technology company that are VC backed. And in Brazil, we still don't have that. So uh, what we expect to happen in Brazil in the course of the next uh, uh, five to 10 years is that we will see more and more large companies homegrown that are backed by VCs becoming the, the fastest growing and the biggest uh, companies in uh, Brazil and Latin America. Thank you so much. This is uh, uh, what I had to, to share with you today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Anderson. So I'm going to move on with other speakers, but what I would like to ask um, to Mr. Jung, Jung and, and Anderson is that because uh, our moderator is having a little bit of difficulty in the con with the connection, uh, it would be really interesting if Anderson addressed one question to Mr. Jung as an expert okay, on your region, and Mr. Jung addresses a question to, to Anderson. I think we can learn a lot from each of you, okay? So let's move on uh, with uh, Jang Ji Wung Jang, uh, founder of, uh, and CEO of the South Korea startup Tewida Inc. Seoul, South Korea. So uh, Mr. Uh, Jang, can you share with us your experience as an entrepreneur of a South Korean startup? Then we'll have a Guilherme, then we come back with the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Ji, and I'm from the Tuida. And Tuida is a small startup company in Seoul. And what we are doing right now is we are providing mobile application in which you can have a virtual conversation with Korean people and practice the speaking skills in Korean. So do I have to introduce about my business or yeah, you can share a little bit about your experience as an entrepreneur of a startup, Korean startup. You have a, like a five minutes, you know, very quickly. Yeah. Okay, great. And what your company does also. Okay, great, great. Okay, give me one second. So, uh, yeah. Uh, every, I think everybody's on, aware about these two words, about the Gen Z and COVID, because these two words is nowadays the most of the Korean startup companies are focusing on the uh, non on 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 on, on tech or technology and some metaverse as as usual. So what we are trying to is uh, with these two keywords, uh, we are focusing on to education service. So. Uh, this is our service. So in the application, we provide some video uh, lessons which you can virtually communicate with the teachers and overcome to fear of speaking by simulating realist conversation. So during these two minutes, you can practice uh, pronunciation and speaking uh, and learning meanings of one expressions. So after you practice the speaking, uh, three or five sentences in the lesson video, we drive you to the uh, simulation conversation. So in here, uh, you can have a virtual conversation with Korean people in real life situation. And our system uh, understand your uh, pronunciation accuracy and how much the Korean people can understand your speaking. So from that, uh, we give two different scenarios. For example, your pronunciation, okay, the scenario is going to move forward. If not, the actors in the video reacting, or oh, pardon me, or can you speak again like this? So this interactive uh, conversation and on text service, we believe uh, the people who really want to improve their speaking skills in foreign language, but they don't have a much, much of opportunity to uh, having a conversation with a real person, uh, our solution can be the, one of the solutions to practice the conversation. 
So we have been launched our service last June, and our cumulative uh, download has been reached more than 800,000 uh, downloads. And uh, since last November, we rank third in Korean language education application and first in Korean speaking. And also, we got 4.8 uh, app store rate at this moment. And we have more than, oh, sorry, we have more than 170,000 monthly active users right now. And our total revenue is 200,000 so far. And every month we raise about $4,000 at this moment. So, later on, uh, as I mentioned before, nowadays most of the Korea startups focus on the education and the metaverse and also on tech technologies. And TIDA is the startup which is providing some on tech solution for learning language or uh, foreign language. So, we are going to expand our service as a multi language speaking practice apps. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on. Now we have uh, Guilherme Carboni, partner of CQS uh, Advogados. Uh, so Guilherme, can you share with us uh, about sharing economy and digital platform and regulatory challenges um, in about sure. five, six minutes? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. OK, I have a presentation, actually. Hello, everyone. I would like, first of all, to thank Sue for the invitation, for the opportunity. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to share. I have a I, I'll be very, very brief. But anyway, I have a presentation, a quick presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about sharing economy, although we know that with the pandemic, has been very affected, at least in the in its uh, strict definition. Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, definitions, it's very, very difficult to, to have a precise definition. There is no consensus. Uh, there is a broad concept and a strict, uh, a strict concept as well. In, in a broad concept, we could say that it involves both one-sided platforms, which we can also uh, call as a business uh, to peer, and a two-sided platforms, which is the peer to peer. So let's have a look in the first one. Uh, one-sided platforms, we have provider, platform and user. And, and in this model, a platform acquires the rights and uh, over a content or a product and then sells it to user or licenses it to user. Uh, some, some examples here in Brazil, we have Tembici, which is a company involved in the bike renting and it buys the bikes and rent to, to customers. Spotify with music and Netflix films. Some examples on one-sided platforms. And the second one, two-sided platforms, the model peer-to-peer. -peer. We have provider platform and use it as well. But in this case, a provider uh, will furnish directly to user the products or the content and the platform only do the intermediation. And so we have another, uh, another uh, uh, challenge in terms of uh, legal issues. Um, in this model, we also have a situation without sharing of goods. And we have some examples in sale of goods like Mercado Livre, uh, OLX, and they connect people, they connect the, 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 the uh, company that's furnishing the goods and, 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 and customers. And on the other hand, uh, we have the sharing of goods, which in, in terms of a, a strict concept, we, when we talk about a sharing economy in a strict concept, we are talking about sharing of goods and uh, uh, another name would be the collaborative economy. Uh, it's a kind of a hybrid economy in which we have a market and, and collaborative characteristics together, all, all together. Some examples, Uber, Airbnb, BlaBlaCar, and so on. And 
Of course, we have lots of legal issues, uh, regulatory challenges, and some of them, uh, just to summarize, we have consumer protection issues, for example, liability for products and services, who is the furnisher or provider, uh, labor law, uh, what kind of labor relation exists with collab uh, collaborators, for, uh, problems we have with Uber and so on, intellectual property law, new licensing models, public execution of music issues, uh, for sure personal data and privacy, uh, where the personal data is collected, liabilities. Property law, we have some interesting cases uh, involving new ownership arrangements like cooperatives, uh, platform cooperatives, and contract law as well, in terms of new contractual arrangements and so on. So uh, we have lots of challenges. With, in most of the cases, our regulations do not... Uh, uh, they, uh, they can't deal with these new situations. And so our, our firm is very is focused on, on media entertainment and technology law. And that's all. Uh, I would like to thank you again. And uh, Sue, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Guilherme. So now I would like to uh, go back to um, Anderson and, and Mr. Zhang. So first, Anderson, would you like to address a question to Mr. Zhang and, and, and we can do the, uh, the opposite side? Certainly. So uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Zhang, for uh, being here with us. Uh, it's really interesting, uh, the corporate venture architecture that you uh, discussed and congratulations for the work and uh, for the, the, the size of the operation that you are running. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of activity from uh, local corporate ventures and only a, a handful of international or global ones uh, playing here. I think Intel is probably one of the oldest. They started here in, in the, uh, before the first bubble, before the, the year 2000. More recently, we see Qualcomm uh, ventures also very active, but we do not see a lot of uh, global players. Uh, and I actually agree 100% with what you said, that entrepreneurs have to be very careful, uh, not only with uh, which corporate venture they partner with, but also when they partner with these corporate ventures, uh, uh, corporate venture funds. So uh, it would be very interesting for our ecosystem to enjoy more and more the participation of large and mature corporate venture operations like yours. So uh, what would be uh, the ideal conditions for uh, operation like yours to start making more uh, investments in our region and uh, uh, to, you know, so that we could foster the exchange also between Brazil and Korea? Wow, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I think you, you made a very good question in a very short time, and I appreciate that. Um, to answer your question, uh, I think there are specific reasons why we open offices into uh, uh, specific locations to join the ecosystem. And I think it would be easier for us to enter into Brazilian uh, ecosystem if the, uh, the solution that you guys are coming up with has the uh, better matching of application and implementation. So eventually what we are trying to do is we want to take the solution back to Korea. And that's our backyard. We got to win it in our backyard. So meaning we are going to try it in Korea first. And if it works, then we are going to take that to other uh, customers that we have in different countries. Because one of the questions that we get from our customer is, have you done it? Have you done it yourself? And we need to be able to answer that question. That means we are going to try it in Korea. And uh, when we try it in Korea, what rule or regulations does it, is it, work, is it easier to work with? Is it US or is it Brazil? So there, there is a bit of a differentiation in terms of the uh, norm and the uh, uh, regulations and uh, all the solutions that's been populated in each nation has been uh, going towards the uh, regulations that they have in their countries. So uh, if there is more and more uh, uh, communication and coordination between two countries, between Korea and Brazil, uh, I think there will be more and more common stuff starting to overlap. And that's when we can uh, really think about 
having the uh, the office open in in Brazil and start working with uh, other uh, uh, startups in 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 Brazil. And um, I guess uh, I also like to uh, understand a little bit better from your side uh, that. Uh, you about working as a VC and me working as a CVC, we definitely have a very uh, uh, like similar overlapping areas, but also uh, different aspects that we come from. But when you make investments, uh, what, what is the go and no go uh, factors uh, and what kind of uh, uh, advices do you give to these startups when they are trying to go into different countries? Fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, coincidentally, I was on the CVC side before. I was uh, with Naspers in uh, 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 starting here. So, uh, you know, I've been both sides and uh, uh, I, I used to criticize VCs for the things that now I defend as an <laughs> advantage, you know, like I'm sure you the time frame and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, kidding aside, uh, the, the, the work we do is very early stage, so seed, series A and series B. So it tends to be very flexible about most things because the business itself can change a lot during the, the period that we are investing. Uh, even the market focus can change a little bit. The area that we are uh, uh, more uh, strict about is the team. So in the end, the, the team, the founding team is what we are uh, investing on, what we are backing. So there is where uh, we are more uh, stringent. And the, the biggest no-no is uh, a team that uh, uh, we don't believe we can uh, work well with uh, because we are in a weird business of selling money. And the only way to differentiate our our product, so to speak, is with the smart part of it. We say the smart money, and we all say smart money. So the only way that we can uh, uh, build our business and add value is helping the entrepreneur. Uh, and some of them uh, are not very coachable, that, and they might actually be very successful, irrespective of that. So for us, the biggest no-no is if we don't get along with the team, and if the team is not uh, willing to collaborate and, and uh, share experience with us. This is by far the, the biggest one. Yeah, I, I, I will definitely echo what you said because we also look at the team and we like to make sure that uh, if it's the team that's going to hit a home run, maybe not in this game, but in the next game, and we want to bet our money on those, uh, money on those team so that uh, we can follow to work with them uh, uh, continuously. and. Uh, what you said is definitely right and i i hope that all the uh, startups in this uh, session is able to take away from your answer uh, how to really build up the strong team and uh, i think the rest of it will actually come after that um so sue uh do you want us to continue with the questions or uh do you want to take and uh, uh move over to the next session so i would love to continue this discussion but my role here is to control the time so we definitely should continue this discussion, Mr. Zhang and Anderson. Thanks so much for your time. And Mr. Zhang, uh, yeah, Mr. Zhang and Guilherme, thank you so much for your presentation. So very quickly before we move to the second, uh, the next panel. So Mr. Zhang, can you answer? Uh, do you have any plan to go overseas, Latin America? Zhang, can you answer? Yeah. So actually, I'm sorry, so I. I Okay. 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 So answer. yeah, to answer yeah to answer your question to uh yeah, Twitter is already uh providing our service mainly in the United States, and also recently we started to provide our service in Portuguese. So we are trying to expand the, our service in Brazil also. Okay. So let's move on because we have a time time issue here, and we can continue this discussion. So thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. Zhang and uh, Guilherme and Anderson and Mr. Zhang. So now let's move on to the panel three, uh, art and culture. Uh, the moderator is uh, Sergio Miyazaki, um, culture project consultant. So please um, take the floor, Sergio. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm going to mediate the panel Art and Culture. 
and our panel on art and culture will talk not only about uh, business but about intangible values south korea is currently being successful not only in music uh, with international k-pop K bands but its movies series and actors and actresses are being recognized south korea rich culture is expanding overseas and tonight we are going to get to know some of the best case of this state of the art. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Priscilla Cunha de Oliveira Santos, uh, coordinator of Pandora Films. She will talk about independent Korean films. Uh, Priscilla, you can start. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Sue, for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here. Um, well, I have to start saying that I have um, a, huge, a huge passion for movies and the way this experience has to affect people. Uh, I'm also uh, very curious about cultural public policies né, and its subtle power to influence nations even. And uh, that's why I'm a fan of Korean strategic cultural policies and that uh, resulted, resulted in Hallyu. And I think we have a lot to learn from Korea in that aspect. Many others too, but uh, especially in this one. Uh, and I'm going to start telling, uh, telling you a little bit about Pandora Films. Uh, Pandora is a 30-year Brazilian independent film distribution company. Uh, that means we buy films internationally and we distribute and release them in theaters. Uh, and we also sell them uh, to streaming platforms and to TVs. Our main challenge is to buy art house films outside and to make these movies reach its, its audience here in Brazil. Uh, we have a team that goes to international film festivals around the globe. And it's a very intuitive process. It's about watching films and choosing films that you believe might please the Brazilian audience. But obviously it's also business. So you have to pay an, a minimum guarantee for each title. And uh, that title has to perform well so that you can make money. Uh, it's a risky and a very fast changing market as well. So in the beginning of uh, 2000, Pandora started to get interested in Korean films. Our team realized that uh, Korea had been producing many movies with um, technical and um, artistic value, independent films that were being awarded in festivals and uh, connected with what we were looking for at that moment. And in 2006, we bought the first Korean film released by Pandora. It was The Host by uh, Bong Joon-ho. I'm sorry, my Korean pronunciation. But um, at that time, it didn't perform well. It was very disappointing. Um, today, the film is in that Netflix catalog. But uh, at that time, uh, the Brazilian audience was not prepared for that. And um, after that first experience, we brought many titles from uh, Hong San Su. His, um, He's called by many people the Wood Allen from Korea because uh, he has many films with uh, long dialogues and uh, films that address day-to-day -day relations, relationships. He has a very poetic approach. And we started bringing films with Kim Min-hee that became more known here with uh, The Hands Made Tale. It was a, a great success. Uh, in 2018, we bought Burning by Lee Shan Dong. Uh, the film had uh, very good reviews, um, uh, talented director. It had a famous Korean actor called uh, Steven Yoon. Um, he was uh, internationally known. And um, it was chosen to be like the Korean choice for the Oscar that year. And Korean institutions here in Brazil helped us a lot with the promotion. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't reach a big audience in theaters. Uh, although we sold it to um, some channels in TV, pay TV. Uh, and after that, those experiences, finally, in uh, 2019, uh, we had the most successful experience in the history of Pandora because we bought a Parasite in Cannes Festival in France, 
a little before it won the biggest award of the festival that's called Palm d'Or. And um, we released the film here in the end of 2019. I remember I, uh, I went to, to that, this encounter with Sue in 2019 and uh, I was trying to promote the film and I was trying to convince people to watch the film. Um, a few people actually uh, knew it. And uh, it was funny because people looked at me uh, in a very curious way and uh, uh, it was before the Oscar. So the, the, the feeling that I had was like, uh, well, like, who is this strange woman trying to, to make us watch a, a Korean film? that it's, uh, it wasn't even released at that time. And um, uh, the film was like huge. You know, people started talking about it. Uh, and uh, after it won the Oscars, uh, we reached here in Brazil uh, more than one million people in Brazilian theaters. Um, and uh, it was uh, in cinemas um, in March in 2020, and it only got out because of the pandemic. Uh, so for a Korean film with Portuguese subtitles, um, it was uh, we, we, like the film became history itself. And I do believe that Korean cultural public policies and uh, the support of Korean companies that financed the, the promotion of uh, Korean culture internationally really helped into this process of um, transforming the way people look at Korea nowadays. So I think we have a lot to learn with them, now uh, with you, with Korea. And uh, before I finish, I would like to invite those of you who are in Brazil and uh, who like art house movies to get to know a little bit about our streaming platform called uh, Belas Artes a la Carte. Uh, it, it's a partnership between the Cinema Bellas Arts, that's very traditional here in Sao Paulo, and Pandora Films. And uh, the platform has um, about 400 titles, art house films, and some commercial films as well, and many and many Korean titles, like Kinky Duk, Hong Sun Su, uh, Lee Shan Dong, many others. And uh, well, uh, that's basically what I had to share. And thank you again for hearing, and I'm available if you have any questions. All right, Sergio, uh, we can hear, I can hear you. Uh, thank you, Priscilla. Uh, uh... I would like uh, to ask one question. I would like to, to know about after Parasite, after the, the Oscar, uh, do you think the Brazilian people start to, to watch more Korean films or series? Do you have any, any uh, statistic or information? Um, I do not have uh, statistics uh, right now because, unfortunately, cinemas um, were closed for a long time. But uh, we, we did buy some other um, Korean titles um, during the pandemic, but we haven't released them yet. But I do believe that uh, uh, we have like a, a huge, uh, a big opportunity now with this success. I do believe that people are looking uh, more to Korean films nowadays after this, this big hit. Okay, thank you, Priscilla. Well, uh, let's go through uh, now uh, our second speaker, Mr. Youngman Kang. Uh, he is uh, founder of Seoul Webfest, K Webfest, and a filmmaker in South Korea. Uh, Mr. Kang, you can, your turn. Hi, uh, my name is uh, uh, Young Man Kang. Uh, actually, I'm a filmmaker and also uh, organize uh, uh, two festivals in South Korea. One is uh, Solar Fest and the other one is Asia Web Awards. And then also, uh, I used to uh, 
you know, make a film, feature film, but now move to a web series. So Korean said the web drama, because uh, all the OTT platform is getting popular. And then also all the series, so a lot of young people watch it through smartphone. So uh, uh, I think the film business is really getting slow. Then on the other hand, the uh, web so content is going up. So uh, actually my uh, production company is more produce uh, series these days. So today, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, talk about my uh, production company usually uh, produce uh, the series about branded uh, web series. So which means uh, working for uh, the corporation, the companies uh, through uh, the storytelling or the promotional, they are uh, the images. So uh, let me uh, try to open uh, the PPT. So Mr. Kang, I'm going to uh -huh. try to share your presentation, OK? OK. OK. It will take a little bit, a uh, few minutes. So oh. you can just, uh, yeah, if you have something to share. OK, so if, if it doesn't work, uh, then maybe I can just, you know, I can talk, explain, like. Yeah, just to like, talk like and I'll, I'll get the screen for you, OK? OK. Okay, so uh, um, what is the brandy, the web series? I mean, I mean, I know everybody knows about the series, web series from uh, the TV series, but now through uh, the mobile and then web. So that's what we call the web series. But the Korean, I mean, a lot of uh, web series actually produced um, branded because uh, all the creators, they need the money to produce uh, the project. So they uh, approach the corporation, the company, and then they have a budget for uh, advertising. And then a uh, production company are uh, hired and then make uh, the series um, with the uh, based upon the storytelling. So uh, um, a lot of uh, corpor corporation companies, they used to uh, the promote uh, through through uh, just the TV commercials like for it's very traditional, but the people, the audience, they want something. Okay, now it's up. Yeah, you just instruct me. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next page. Okay, so actually I'm um, yeah, talking about uh, the branded web series of uh, uh, the video entertainment produced by a brand marketing uh, department and distributed through uh, the online. And then uh, highly uh, branded property and open label as a sponsors from our corporation the companies. Okay, so let's go to next page. Thank you. So I already explained um, the Korean set, the web drama. So there's a three ways um, produce web drama. Uh, Self-funded by creator or investor, and then also uh, the management company, because uh, the Korean company is, is a lot of uh, artists. For example, the K-pop star, also actors, actresses, so uh, they are um, they are using those talent in the uh, the series, and the last one's branded series. So let's go to next page. So let's say branded uh, web series have a lot of different uh, categories. For example, first one is a uh, cosmetic, uh, like a K Korean beauty, right? K beauty. So very popular. So they have, the companies actually they produce a lot of branded series with the storytelling. Also bank and uh, airport, even the church, the religion, and then uh, airport, also uh, local like tourism, even the army. 
Uh, then uh, also the K-pop stars. So next page. So this is actually one of uh, our production company produced uh, like two years ago, just be before uh, the coronavirus pandemic. So this uh, corporation company is one of the, the largest company in South Korea. It's called the Lotte Corporations. And then uh, I uh, discovered the, uh, the name of the company came from very famous uh, German writer, Goethe. The sorrows of young Goethe, the novel, the main female character, her name is Lotte. So uh, the corporation company founder founded company with the name. And then right now they built a huge uh, over 123 stories building. It's a Lotte World Tower in Seoul. So uh, I approached them to make a branded series with that uh, building and then also the original the Lotte house in Germany, the city of Bachelor. So then actually both side they agreed upon. So I produced uh, this uh, series. So promote both side, uh, German and uh, Korea, cultural and then also uh, the corporations. Let's go to the next page. And then also uh, uh, one of uh, my product company also produced uh, the branded series is animation. It's a Korean like national popular food. It's a kimchi. So uh, the kimchi plus like a Popeye superhero idea. So uh, it's, a, it's a promote also uh, the healthy food, uh, the Korean for the kimchi. So it's the, also uh, the branded series. And go to the next one. So now that project is uh, combined into one of the, uh, the Brazilian also animation production company. So actually right now we are developing uh, the project, expanding uh, more uh, series with uh, several characters from uh, Brazil. And then also uh, the character, uh, the kimchi warrior from the, uh, the original uh, the series. So right now we're developing uh, this project and then also looking for uh, sponsors and investors, any possibilities. And the next one, I think so. Uh, yes, pretty much uh, actually my production company is doing a uh, produce a branded series. So any questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Kang. Uh, how do you develop an idea to create a web series, a web branded series for a, for a company? How do you develop one idea for this? Okay. Your, your, your company. Okay. So I already mentioned uh, the, the series, the Lotte Corporation. That's like a very good example. How I discovered the idea, then how I approached to the uh, corporation company. So. Uh, usually, corporation company actually they they don't have any idea because they are not creator. They are just like businessmen. They have only money and they want just like their corporation. The image is like out for the audience, right? So uh, our creator's job actually develop like very nice storytelling. Then not only good story also. Uh, uh, automatically uh, appeal the image, uh, image of the uh, corporation company through uh, the storytelling. So let's say uh, the Lotte uh, corporation company has already nice name of the branded and how the corporation company founded, you know, with the name. So that's why I approached with the name and then the other side the name actually origin from the Germany. Also, the German writer got a very famous, and then his novel already, you know, bestseller in the world. So everybody knows. So I combine the both ideas. So I think uh, those kind of like a perfect match. So promote automatically cultural promotion from German side and also corporation image. Uh, 
like promotion from Korean side. So that's why I approached. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kang. Well, uh, let's move on. Uh, our third speaker is Luciano Candizani. Luciano, are you there? Uh, Luciano is a documentary photographer of National Geographic, author of the acclaimed essay Henu, Woman of the Sea on the Culture of Diving Ladies from Jeju Island, South Korea. Uh, Luciano? Yeah, Luciano is here. Welcome, Luciano. Welcome, Luciano. Yeah, I think we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Hear you. Yes. yes. Perfect. Thank okay. You. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Thank you again so, for the invitation. So I think I think uh, uh, the presentation is on the screen. The last presentation. Okay. Yeah, the, la the last presentation is still in. Okay. Okay, it's out. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can start, Luciano. Okay, thank you again. It's a pleasure and an honor to me to, to be here. And to, it would be nice to, to share with you um, actually what is the one of the most amazing experiences I have had in my life as a a documentary photographer and it was in Jeju Island south in the southern tip of South Korea in 2017 uh, I I was there in Jeju Island and I was able to uh, go to the sea and dive with the nine two years old uh, diver uh, called uh, Hyun Sung Jik uh, dive in a free diving to 10 meters deep cold waters of the island. It was an amazing ex experience, and uh, also it was really uh, uh, nice to see how these uh, how Hyun on these ladies, uh, which are 4,000 uh, ladies, still dive. Under under uh, cultural codes uh, that that is uh, uh, really um, original for four four centuries. It was a really amazing experience. I went to Jeju Island for the first time in two, 2017 as. Uh, uh, to produce pictures to, to do a, a, a still documentary photography. And to be uh, uh, to be a, a, a part of a documentary to show the life of the woman divers of Jeju Island. So my mission was to produce the pictures, but uh, a, a, a camera a cameraman was uh, with me uh, diving into the sea and on land, and um, and, and and showing everything that was. Uh, in front of the lens so the 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 documentary a two hours documentary it shows the life of the woman divers uh, through my my movements as a photographer to take the pictures i am i am like uh, work as a a link between uh, the, the the woman divers in front of the lens and the expectators so uh, i would like to share with you some of the pictures. This documentary was released in 2018 in Brazil and now it's, uh, it's available uh, free in the internet. So uh, maybe later you can share with everyone the link for the film. Uh, right now I'd, I would like to show you some of the pictures. Mm. <clears throat> Let me share my presentation here. Just a, <clears throat> just a second. Yeah, it's here. OK. 
Okay. Can can you see my my presentation? No, actually, Not yet. it's processing. Uh, I think it's oh, working now. <coughs> Still processing. So actually, I see two screens. Now it's yeah. Now it's perfect, Lucien. Okay. Can you yeah? So I'm can, I'm gonna show you like a full screen, yeah. Full screen, okay. By the way, you have a comment from the the audience, Lucien. I need to read it so that you can just consider it. Luciano, I saw Henio in an art expo in Jeju. Never imagined it was made by a Brazilian. Amazing work. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to share with, uh, with you some of the pictures from, from this uh, work. Actually, the, 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 the documentary was released in 2018, but in 2019, we also uh, had a, a, a big exhibition of the pictures in the Museu uh, da Imagem e do Som in São Paulo, a big exhibition, and uh, the, the Brazilian, the public could really uh, get in touch with the values, with the many uh, important values of the Henio culture. It's, it's go, go uh, very deep in the uh, values of this culture. So some of the pictures here, we can see the Yung Sonjik, 91 years old, is still diving, very health and very good diver. Uh, some of the uh, other divers I could dive with, you know, it's all pictures of this uh, documentary. Uh, see, 73 years old. Nowadays, if uh, 4,000 remaining uh, Henios in Jeju Island, they are almost all of them are between 60 and 91 years old. So probably uh, the last generation of the Henius as a as a functional uh, culture. <clears throat> they go to the scene groups like this one always. 60 years old. It's amazing to see these uh, ladies diving in the cold waters of Jeju Island. Yes, seven, seven years old. And uh, some moments of the, in the life of this uh, woman. Here we have Hume again. And some more pictures. And now, uh, now I'm working in also in a book, in an art book, uh, with the um, pictures and the texts, with my impressions, field impressions, uh, or my contact with the Henius. Yeah. More pictures. <laughs> it's uh, it was really nice to see the reaction of the of people in the exhibition here in Brazil. Uh, it was people uh, started very curious uh, the in the first picture of the exhibition, but in the last one, uh, almost everyone was crying, uh, really touched by the life and all the values the, in the life of these ladies really nice and i'm now i'm very motivated to finish this book with this great story of this uh, culture with this uh measurable value of uh, humanity uh, a landscape of jeju island and 
That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Luciano. Uh, well, uh, we could talk all night about uh, the hand news and this uh, documentary. I think, Luciano, uh, uh, many informations you can uh, watch at YouTube about the hand news and the, the documentary and the, the films at uh, TV Cultura. Uh, well, uh, so I, I don't think we don't we have enough time for other questions. Uh, Sue, you can go to the next panel. Thank you, everybody. Th thank you for thank the. You. Thank you all the speakers of the panel three: uh, art and culture, uh, Priscilla, Mr. Kang, Luciano, and the moderator Sergio. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, it was great. So let's move on. Uh, for the um, let's move on to the panel four: infrastructure. So thank you for the patience the speakers of the panel four, and now uh, Ricardo Medina, our moderator, you have my floor. Uh, you have the floor now, so please. Thank you. Do you hear me well? Yes. Uh, yes, okay, so thank you, Sue. Hello, everyone. Uh, after such great presentations, I can only start by giving thanks to my great and dear friend and colleague, Sue who I met in college and had the privilege of still being around her uh, until this day. Uh, it's an honor to be here today among such well and reputed and uh, so renowned professionals. Um, as, an, as a quick introduction, my name is Ricardo Medina, as Sue already said, I'm a Brazilian lawyer and arbitrator. Uh, I'm an equity partner at Toledo Marquete Advogados. Our law firm is uh, fully focused in, in the infrastructure and construction market. And we, we do all kinds of stuff as long as they relate to, to construction and infrastructure. So we have dispute resolution, complex contracts, public law, tax, m and environmental law, project finance, and so on. So pretty much everything as long as they deal with infrastructure uh, as all you know i was here looking at the resume of our speak speakers some of them i know pretty well and uh, as they are wonderfully qualified players in the infrastructure market uh, i will uh, i'll quit now playing my own and then tune trumpet here and pass on the mic for those who can really be and play in the band. So we didn't really speak before, but uh, if if you guys don't mind, I would really like to, yes. to hear Bruno's Vernac, Bruno Vernac's uh, thoughts. Uh, Bruno Vernac is is one important partner at Mayor Brown uh, Law Firm in São Paulo, Brazil, uh, and he's super reputed lawyer here in infrastructure. And uh, Bruno, could you could you please give us your thoughts on the recent changes and new opportunities in the infrastructure sector in Brazil? Ricardo, thank you very much uh, for your nice words. It's a pleasure to share this panel with you. You were very kind on, on my introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. You are such a great lawyer. I like you and your, your partners a lot, and I'm very happy to see all the growth and success of your firm. Thanks, Sue for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure to be here. I think this is an interesting topic to discuss when we are uh, amidst the Korean uh, people, because unfortunately, and I have been discussing this with Sue many times, we don't see uh, a significant Korean presence in infrastructure in Brazil as we wish and as it could be seen. We know that Korean players are very active in various parts of the world in infrastructure. And we also know that Brazil presents uh, many, many opportunities for foreign investors. I would say that Brazil presents more than ever opportunities in infrastructure for foreign investors. Uh, and we have been seeing many other countries investors being successful in Brazil, such as Europeans, Canadians, Japanese, and so forth. I will try to be brief, uh, to be quick here in considering the time, uh, but we actually have lots of good news in Brazil. 
uh, every infrastructure sector that you look around, you see good changes and you see a, a very good pipeline of opportunity. So I will start with water and sewage because we had a new law issued in water and sewage last year. Uh, <coughs> this new law is actually an amendment to the existing one. So it's not a, a, a very a deep change, quite the opposite. It's just a set of additional measures to, to, to make... Uh, to create more opportunities for the private companies. <clears throat> and we're seeing the results. We just had last month a large auction in the state of Rio de Janeiro, in which there were four blocks of concessions of water and sewage service to private companies uh, involving high very high numbers. I mean, a big premiums paid by the private companies to the government. And the most important thing is that we see a clear pipeline, <coughs> sorry, of concessions and PPPs on the way in water and sewage. Uh, it's a sector that is very welcome to foreign investors. We already see the presence of foreign investors such as CPPIB. Bruno, we cannot hear you. You are on mute now. Sorry, sorry, I, I push it, sorry. I was saying that, that, that that's, that's a... <coughs> That's an area that we already see lots of foreign investors, such as Brookfield, Sumitomo, uh, CPPIB from Canada, Enco from Canada. But there is clearly uh, 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 many opportunities for any other company considering investing in water and sewage. Either through M&A, there are always some M&A opportunities available, but also by means of the, of the huge pipeline that we are coming. Also, when we talk about water and sewage, uh, reminds of waste. In Brazil, waste is covered under the same law, and waste is an area that uh, has also greatly benefited from the new law. <clears throat> so we have a huge pipeline of uh, uh, municipal concessions for waste and waste uh, to energy. That's an area where we don't see the presence of the large state-controlled companies, so the opportunities are even uh, greater to waste to energy, to biogas, or to any other source of technology that will address uh, the waste generation. Brazil uh, is a very underdeveloped in this area, and the opportunities are very good. And the good news is that the law expressly establishes that the trash fee, the trash tariff, can be charged in the water bill. So the problem that the cities always had challenge to pay for the waste services it's going to be addressed to the extent that the, that fee can be charged from the consumers on the water bill, uh, and therefore the source of payment to the private investor can be collateralized and can be very safe, e exactly as we do in public lighting, where we have a, a, a fee that is charged from the, from the citizens in the energy bill, and therefore the level of default is quite low, and the private investor has a very good collateral to cover for the payment uh, of its investments and its service. <coughs> Moving on to toll roads, we already saw some auctions this year, and there is a huge pipeline. We'll talk about state roads, federal roads. We'll talk about Dutra, which is the toll road between Rio and Sao Paulo. There's going to be an auction next month. There's going to be an auction in July, and there are at least seven to ten auctions in the next 18 months. So that's, again, another area where we see a lot of opportunities, a big pipeline, and would make a lot of sense for foreign investors to consider. And on toll roads, what we are also seeing is some projects where the government is uh, sharing with the investors the demand risk. That has always been something that the government was resistant in Brazil to bear or to share the demand risk. And the government, because of COVID, the government is now being able to share uh, the demand risk. So that's a very interesting news that we saw in toll roads. When you talk about, <coughs> sorry, when you talk about port terminals, the governor continues to do the auctions. The auctions scheduled this year for all sorts of cargo, for containers, for, for solid, uh, and all sorts of cargo. So there is a big pipeline uh, as well uh, available. When we refer to toll roads, there was an auction last month. It was Fiol, sorry, hey, railway. was Fiol Railway in the state of Bahia. That was won by Bamin, which is a European company. 
and they are open to partnership because they have a very large integrated mining uh, railway port project. And we're going to see later this year the Ferrogrão project, which is a landmark because it's a railway that's going to link the center of Brazil, the soybean production area, to the ports in the north. That is should happen later this year. It's a very large and very important project. We're going to talk about uh, investments of at least 10 billion uh, reais. It's a greenfield uh, railway, 900 kilometers. And in this project, the government has also made its part. The government is willing to cover any uh, expenses above a certain cap in relation to environmental obligations and in relation to uh, expropriation uh, costs. So we talked about water and sewage, we talked about uh, toll roads, about the ports. Uh, we just had uh, a large auction for airports, not a lot of interest parties, but still a very large premium. Uh, CCR from Brazil and Vinci from French they were the two big winners. And next year, we're probably going to have our last large auction program. It's probably going to be the biggest, the, the last uh, big chance to enter into the market where we're going to see the concessions of the airports, both in Rio, the city airports, both in Rio and Sao Paulo. We also have some opportunities at the state level. The state of Piauí just announced today the PPPs for two regional airports in Piauí and the state of Sao Paulo is undergoing a uh, concession for some of the state of Sao Paulo uh, local uh, airports. So uh, plenty of opportunities, many interesting changes. It's very important to mention that the federal government of Brazil was one of the first in the world to recognize the COVID as a, as a cause for the economic equilibrium, for the economic adjustment of the concession contracts. And that has been playing well because we continue to see a lot of interest uh, in these uh, infrastructure auctions uh, across the board. So again, we will really welcome uh, foreign investors and local investors to continue to pay attention to infrastructure. And we're very happy to see that after times when Brazil faced many philosophical political discussions, we have a very strong pipeline uh, being developed and being auctioned to private investors. These were my considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Fantastic. What an overview here. Uh, I couldn't expect less, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Now, you know what, Pedro? Let me save the best for last. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll leave our friend here, Kunjun O, oh, for, the, for the final uh, part of our panel, because I want to try and hook what we have just spoken here with, uh, with the ideas that Pedro Kassabi is about to share with us. So Pedro Kassabi, who's the head of investment banking of Banco Fator, could you please enlighten us, sir, with uh, their ideas and thoughts on highlights of the pipeline of opportunities and in infrastructure? Okay, well, Ricardo, thanks for the introduction. Uh, happy to be sharing uh, the panel with everyone, with you, Ricardo, uh, you. with you, Bruno, with Mr. O as well. Uh, so I, I, we, uh, I, I fully agree with uh, with Bruno. I think it was an excellent introduction. I think all around uh, the infrastructure sector uh, is in a very good position, uh, given the the whole uh, liquidity environment in the world. Uh, you know, the, the governments uh, uh, printing money and uh, approving emergency budgets. That of course nobody denies that they're necessary at this point, but. Um, Real assets at this stage are, are a safe harbor uh, for uh, the inflation, uh, inflationary pressures that we're uh, start, starting to see uh, increasing. So uh, we expect uh, more and more uh, investors seeking uh, additional yield and, and uh, looking for exposure uh, to the broad uh, infrastructure sector as a whole. In Brazil has a uh, 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 typically projects that are not uh, denominated in hard currency, which is uh, one uh, 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 major issue that typically uh, international investors need to, uh, to overcome before investing here. And uh, we, we hope that uh, it won't be 
different uh, and, and that uh, some some people in the audience will uh, take the leap as, as Bruno uh, uh, introduced and, and, and start uh, also uh, investing in the sector here. Um, as highlights, uh, uh, we, we broadly agree with uh, with Bruno's view. So water and sewage is uh, is one of the major opportunities. Uh, uh, Sedai was was a was a big hit. Uh, we we were uh, fortunate enough to be uh, advising uh, the government uh, through BNDS uh, in, in the structuring of that project. Uh, so we expect more like that to come. It's it's a sector that's. Uh, uh, still highly uh, uh, state-owned, highly inefficient, and uh, there is uh, a lot of room for uh, for private players to come in with uh, more invest investments and, uh, and bringing in uh, expertise and, and efficiency to the sector. So we're very, very optimistic about water and sewage. Uh, it is a sector with uh, historically uh, low uh, revenue volatility with um, uh, increasingly uh, robust uh, um, uh, regulatory framework. Uh, it's not quite up there with uh, uh, with power yet, which is uh, the, probably the benchmark in Brazil, uh, generation, transmission, and dis distribution. But but it's getting there, uh, and uh, of course there is uh, on a risk-adjusted basis. We we think that uh, it's uh, it's highly attractive. Another sector that we are uh, extremely optimistic about is, is gas. As you know, we have a new uh, regulatory framework for gas. Uh, Petrobras, which is the uh, major player in this market, is, is expected to, uh, to break up their monopoly of the midstream and downstream. So this will open up uh, lots of opportunities and is opening up uh, lots of opportunities in uh, gas treatment, in uh, gas transportation, gas distribution. Uh, there, there is uh, expected to be uh, the sale uh, either as a block or, or some of the, in, in, in the case of some of them uh, individually uh, of Gas Petro, which is the the distribution arm uh, of Petrobras. And furthermore, which is probably maybe in our view, maybe even the, the most interesting part of it is that uh, a gas trading uh, market is being developed. Uh, some of the the the, the big uh, energy trading uh, firms are already opening up uh, gas trading arms. Uh, furthermore, uh, we also see a, a, a very interesting opportunity in uh, in public public lighting, which uh, for the newer projects is not even uh, circumscribed to public lighting uh, per se, but also uh, includes a very very uh, interesting uh, smart cities uh, component. Uh, as is the case, for instance, in in Rio and and other cities, so it includes uh, uh, smart traffic lights, smart uh, uh, cameras, and uh, uh, free Wi-Fi. So it's it's uh, they're very uh, very exciting projects. Um, furthermore, uh, which is probably more of a frontier market, but with uh, a huge interest from investors uh, more recently which is the, the green hydrogen uh, market. Uh, it's still uh, relatively uh, frontier at this stage, but uh, we expect that in, in a year or two, uh, this will be a, a booming market because it at the same time presents a very, uh, a very efficient solution for, uh, for energy storage. Uh, it uh, it's, uh, goes a long way towards uh, solving uh, the, the the energy storage of our uh, issue of our renewables, uh, which of course as their uh, intermittent power sources uh, could create problems, but uh, and and also is a is an effective way to uh, to transport uh, energy. So uh, this this is also a, a market where we see a lot of interest from uh, from investors, but. I mean, uh, I, I fully agree with Bruno that there are opportunities all around. Uh, if you look at uh, almost every sector, uh, some of them are more, more consolidated, uh, some of them are uh, a bit uh, uh, less developed, but uh, I, I think it's fair to say that all of them are in, in a much better shape than, than uh, they have been uh, in the past several years. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Excellent, excellent exposition here, presentation. Um, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's even more than just opportunities. I, I'm seeing really actual, real, real possibilities here. So we really need to get our Korean friends down here to get this going, right? And uh, to, you know, saving the best for last, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Kyung Jing Oh, who's a CEO at POSCO ENC Brazil. Uh, he will speak about POSCO's overseas investment case in Brazil and hope it was, uh, 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 you know, a good story for him and for us here to, to hear. Uh, Mr. Oh, please, you have the word. Yeah, we can see the presentation, Mr. O. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. You Go. Uh, you Mr. Go. Yeah. The screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. You want to put it in the full screen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know how to make this. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. okay? Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, My name is Kyung Jin Oh of POSCO ENC. First of all, is it, it is a great honor to have an opportunity to present POSCO ENC Group's investment cases through uh, CSP project in Brazil market. I think that many of people attending this workshop do not know about POSCO groups, but knows Hyundai, Samsung, Energy, etc. Then I would like to give you a brief idea how to make an, an investment in Brazilian market by Korean company. This is my uh, main purpose uh, of today's presentation, to give you a chance to remember that there is a POSCO group as well as Hyundai Samsung in Brazilian market. Now, let me introduce to you to what kind of company POSCO group it is and what kind of investment has made in infrastructure area in Brazil. POSCO groups, like uh, the Korean companies in Brazil, is not well known, but has invested in Brazilian infrastructure area through CSP project. Then uh, let's see how POSCO group has invested from numeric uh, perspective. Can you guess what these numbers means? 50%, 30%, 20%, 39 versus 377, 12,466 and 248,803. As no. you can see on your, can you see this? So I don't know the answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you see on your screen, there are three numbers. These numbers are not affect your life directly, but these numbers have made a huge contribution to the infrastructure development and job creation in Brazil. Firstly, 50%, 30%, 20% means shareholders investment percentage of CSP project. Shareholders consist of three companies. Bale is very famous for Brazilian. Bale, which is second largest steel mill company and has many mining projects in all, all around the world, invested 50% of CSP project. And Donggu, which is the third largest, largest steel mill company in Korea, invested 30% for CSP project. POSCO, which is PIP's largest steel mill company in the world, and PIP's place in financial ranking in Korea, invested 20% per for CSP project. 
Then I will uh, give you a brief explanation of Shes what Shesp project it is as follows. Project name it, it is Shesp Steel Plant Project. Owner is Shesp. Compania Siderurgica do Pesem. Location is uh, Pesem Industrial uh, Industrial Complex, Ceará State in Brazil. Business Mr. information. Here, another another slide. We are still uh, we I still see the numbers. Ah uh, okay. I, I, uh, uh, sorry yeah yeah sorry. Um. Uh, business information. Three million tons per slab uh, production per year and post first uh, phases of integrated steel mill construction. Construction period is uh, 2012 uh, September to 2016 uh, August. Contract price 4.9 billion US dollars as EPC turnkey project. So So as you can see this uh, the bird eye view of CSP blast furnace area in this regard I would like to emphasize that this is the result of future oriented partnership between uh, Brazil and Korea So can you guess what these numbers mean 39 versus 377 39 versus 377 means a number of subcontractors uh, contractors what we made during CSP project. As you can see the, uh, see the summary of construction contract, there are two types of contract uh, we made, which is one of the direct invoicing and the other is indirect invoicing. Direct invoicing means that was made by contractor by post QNC due to very, very complex tax regulation and tax laws in Brazil. So in order to deduct the tax burden, we choose to operate direct contract from main and critical construction work. So as you can see, the only three, three direct contract, but the total contract price is more than 70% of uh, indirect contract. So as you can see on the bottom, subcontract from northern eastern regions. So during the uh, construction uh, um, period, we hired uh, more than uh, 200 uh, re uh, local company in Brazil and contribute uh, growth, grow up uh, Brazilian uh, markets. And can you guess what, what these numbers mean? 12,466 and 248,803. Means the labor mobilization during the peak point and total months amendments. Members is generally used for the counting how many laborers participating for the construction area. One man month means one man, one man works for one month. So based on that, 70.4 million men work per day until project completion. You can see on the curves until the, the project completion. So I would like to present project, project overview of for your detailed understandings of CSP project. Total construction uh, period is eight years from 2018 to 2019. Site area is 375.7 hectares. It is around 500 soccer field size. Can you imagine that the size of the construction site and local neighbor per year is 7.4 million persons and equipment supply is 1.4 million cubic 
meters. This is uh, uh, the brief uh, over, uh, performance for the CSP project. And on the bottom, you can see the, the, the main equipment competition. There are 19 plants from raw material till power plant. So you can see on the process of steel making. So from raw material to the final production slabs. In addition, uh, you can see on the uh, logistic flow. So uh, the normal, in general, steel made plant located in near harbor. So we can deduct the inland transportation cost. So you can see the from the best and port, all the material uh, transported to the site and inside of the CSP plant, we, we, we uh, transport all the material and equipment during the construction. Uh, in addition, for the sustainability, sust sustainability of company, we did a social volunteer work for sisterhood relation activities and medical volunteer work for supporting Brazilian local people's welfare. And we did uh, vitalizing activities to pick up the gabbages in the residential area. Furthermore, Postco ENC operated technical school for local students to give job opportunities. You can see uh, we are operating the, the technical schools. So in conclusion, considering the hardship of Brazilian construction environment, Postco groups with Postco ENC acknowledge that the successful achievement of this project could be possible through the fundamental support from Brazil local company, especially northern eastern regions. As a newcomer of Brazil uh, market and strategic investors, Costco NC is willing to dedicate itself to achieve certain level of technical skills for the local company by providing additional job training for some key job and by providing technical instruction for welders and scanners. These practical services will definitely create another job opportunity in an industrial area and synergy for subcontractors to make more competitive in CSP's second phases, uh, 300 ton per year uh, in the near future. This is the uh, the the side portal from the uh, the general site view and from raw material and synthet plant and coconut plant blast furnace and steel mill plant continue casting and pop plant. This is uh, what uh, I presented to, uh, prepared today. If we have any. Uh, question and comment, please give me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. O. I told you we all had to applaud you. Thank you very much. Said we were saving okay. the last, the best for last. <laughs> Thank you. So do we have time for, for a question or not? Should we move on to the next panel? I would like to discuss, but uh, because we are, we have no time, on, unfortunately, so I think we should uh, move on to the closing, OK? OK, OK. Well, thank yeah. you very much to all okay. panelists. And I'm very happy that it worked very well with the Korean and Brazilian uh, partnership there for your company, Mr. O. Hope it okay. happens more times. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> OK, you. Uh, so thank you again for the um, uh, speakers of the panel four and the moderator. So Bruno, Pedro, Mr. O, Ricardo Medina, thanks so much. So thank you again uh, for uh, everybody for the patience. So now let's go for the closing. I would like to uh, invite first Orlando, Orlando Dalsing, 
ambassador of our series uh, Brazil Korea 2021 and senior uh, and and works for PwC. In sequence, I would like to invite uh, Songwon Kim, also ambassador of the series and exec director of KB Hana Brazil. So Orlando. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you, thank you for the the the, the brilliant uh, panelists and presentations today. It was uh, a great opportunity for learning and, and networking. I hope we can uh, keep in touch. And uh, it's always a pleasure and and uh, something very special to me to to be part of this this annual event organized by you. So thank you once again. Have a good one. Thank you, Orlando. Someone? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Song. I'm from KB HANA Bank, uh, the first Korean bank established in Brazil. And I, I will be very brief, I promise. Well, a couple of years ago, I learned a word that has changed my perspective of learning and teaching, and I want to share with you. Uh, this short and strong word is ako. It spells A-K-O and comes from the native civilization of New Zealand called Maori. Ako means both learning and teaching. This Maori civilization recognizes the knowledge that both teachers and learners bring to learning interactions and is acknowledges the way that new knowledge and understandings can grow out of shared learning experiences. That's exactly what we're doing here at this event today. Thanks to Sue, we brought so many, who brought so many brilliant and diverse people to this webinar. We had this opportunity to share our knowledge, experience and skills, teaching and learning, and the most important, inspiring and empowering people. Thank you, Sue, and congratulations for this powerful webinar. And take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you. So thank you, Orlando and Sangwon, for the beautiful words for the closing. So thank you again for everybody for the patience. Uh, I think we achieved our goal. We are a little bit late in our time, but uh, we were successful in achieving the goal which is uh, closing all the panels, four panels in different areas. And everybody was very patient and and I hope you had a very good time. It was kind of entertainment for me. Uh, it's really interesting to see how uh, the sharing of knowledge in different areas could be seen as an entertainment. This, is, well, this was very entertaining for us. And I hope this was also very entertaining for you. So I need your support because I want to move on to organize the next edition this year. It's going to be in September, October. So if you are interested in supporting us as uh, a volunteer, by the way, I would like to ask uh, uh, my, I would like to give my words of gratitude to Camila, who uh, worked as a volunteer. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, so again, I ask for your support so that we can organize the next uh, edition in September, October. And let's keep in touch. This was recorded. I'm going to share this recording with you. Uh, I need a little bit of addition, but uh, let's keep in touch, guys. So have a very good night uh, for those who are in Brazil. Good evening. Uh, good, good morning for those who are in Korea. And uh, also uh, good afternoon for those who are in the United States. Oh, actually, it's almost evening time now. So, thank you so much, Guy. Muito obrigada. Boa noite para você, gente. Tchau, Su. Tchau, tchau, tchau. Obrigada. Tchau, tchau. 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 And good morning from Beijing, from China.